welcome. And thank you for joining us online here at the First Church in Chestnut Hill. It would be wonderful to have you here in person, but for right now we have to gather in this particular way at this particular time. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. So ends our readings. We read from the 23rd Psalm, one of the most familiar passages from the Bible, one often cited in difficult times. And yet I did not choose this for the session. It rolls around the roster of readings we use on a list called the lectionary. Someone chose it for this Sunday back in the 90s. It's a moment of serendipity, the matching of ancient words to modern concerns. When we consider words from the Bible, we're often looking for a spark of the divine, a glimpse at something more than ourselves, our lives, our world. The book of Psalms are unusual, therefore, in that they aren't intended to be words coming from God, but they are the words offered up by people to God. These are songs, these are prayers written long ago by people in their times of need, in their moments of anxiety. Some are celebratory songs of thanksgiving, but many are seeking guidance, seeking comfort. They sometimes shift from worry to hope to assurance nearly in the same breath. What did we hear? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God will guide me to wherever I need to go. God will take care of my needs, my needs, not my wants, my needs, not my desires. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Together we will go to a place of calm green grasses, of cool still waters, an ideal place away from trouble, entering into a time of peace away from difficulty. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. My soul, which could be read as my life, my mind, my heart, and I am led onto or back to the right path, the right way, the right life. That is how I am restored, walking along the right path for the sake of God, for the sake of someone other than myself. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even as I am afraid for my life, even as I am close to death, I will not live in fear. For God is with me. God is by my side. God is there comforting me. The rod and staff of the shepherd, the tools used to guide, to help, and to protect the flock, are an image of that presence. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I am fed. I am welcomed. I am invited into the house of God and the presence of God. I am blessed and my life contains many blessings. What will I do with all those blessings? Those that I recognize and those that I probably have forgotten. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness, the caring for the lives and well-being of those around me, goodness shall follow me. Mercy, the gift of forgiveness, neither deserved nor earned, mercy shall be offered to me again and again. Goodness and mercy abounding in the house of God always. The 23rd Psalm is a prayer of hope. It's hope within a dark time. It's a prayer traditionally attributed to David, David who would become the king of Israel anointed, as we heard in our other reading. In the middle of the psalm, there is a reference to anointing, but these aren't the same. These aren't the same ceremonies. When David was chosen by God and anointed by Samuel, he was being tasked with becoming a king. In the psalm, the anointing refers to pouring oil on someone's head as an extravagant practice. It is special, but it's differently special. It is an indulgence. It is a luxury. In the psalm, we're not being chosen to be in charge, but embraced cared for. Cared for even while we're in the shadow of fear or anxiety or death itself. The same is true for the reference to restoring the soul. The soul is a grand idea. It's a big theological notion. But in this reading, the Hebrew word is nefesh. It makes the passage more accurately about restoring one's life. Restoring life's breath to a person as if they were struggling to breathe breathless, now comforted, caring for someone, and saving them. One of the unspoken questions folks might have in a time like this, when things are fraught, when matters are uncertain, is, why is all this happening? The Lord is my shepherd, and yet here I am standing around, wanting, wanting, needing, seeking. How could this be? We need to be careful to separate those ideas, wanting and needing and seeking, Wanting in this sense is about lacking something, as I shall not lack what I need. Wanting something that I don't currently have, that's not necessarily the same. I want a new car. I want a new place to live. Those aren't the same as not having something. And we might occasionally seek things we do not have that we do not need. Need in the sense that these are the things we need to keep on living. Again, Psalm 23 is a hopeful prayer. It's offered up in times of great difficulty. David, later King David, would struggle through many stages of his life. But some of those troubles, many of them, honestly, were because David mistook what he wanted for what he truly needed. Hope is an interesting concept. It is a prediction, really, a positive way of thinking about what is to come next in our lives. Our hopes may be large or small, but they reflect a degree of confidence, a measure of optimism. Things will get better. There are three primary Christian virtues, all called, also called the theological virtues, and one of those is hope. The others are faith and love. When I think about these three ideas, I'm drawn to the words of Paul in his letters to the first letter to the Corinthians during the days of struggle in the early Christian churches. Paul said, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. A mirror dimly, a glass darkly, depending on your preference for King James, 
We don't see clearly. We don't know much, let alone all. Faith, hope, and love abide. They endure. They keep on going. Consider these th three ideas as a pyramid. At the top, the pointy part, is hope. It is the most dramatic of the three. It's the leading edge. Pressing onward, regardless of that dim view, the dark glass through which we struggle to view our way forward, hope is built upon the foundation of the other two. Next comes faith. Faith, which is a confidence in something beyond ourselves. A current belief in something transcendent. In God and all the things that God implies. Not trusting in me, myself, and I, but perhaps more so in we, ourselves, and us. How can we make such a leap of faith? Is it warranted? Is it sensible? How do we get to that level of trust in anything, in anyone? This takes us to the foundation of the pyramid, the sturdy and solid basis upon which the seemingly shaky ideas of hope and faith are built. The foundation is love. It's love. It's not gooey, squishy, cartoonish love. Love that looks great in the movies for a couple of hours, but doesn't last a week in real life. This type of love is enduring because it's plain and it's simple. It's love in the form of caring for another person, caring for others in general. It's not about grand gestures. Those, those, those can be nice. It's about weaving together the most basic parts of our lives, the needs we have rather than the wants in our minds. Love in this sense is unconditional and it arises with the belief that God loves us without limit. And that is easier to imagine if we have experienced a form of abiding love in our lives. It could be from our parents, our grandparents, a spouse, a sibling, a friend, whoever. Once we can picture love without condition, we can form that into the expectation that love can be ongoing. That leads to faith in the present, and it leads to hope in the future. And if we struggle with that first step of love, unbounded by conditions in our personal relationships, then we might turn to other examples. It is said that the greatest bond of love can be found in grandchildren and dogs. I'm not trying to equate those two. But those relationships are often more freewheeling, more unconditioned than the hardworking love we have to share with our spouses or our partners or our children or our friends in those relationships. Those are the loves we have to work at, loves that occasionally evolve saying no to someone. And yes, love more than occasionally means saying no. Some days it might involve rubbing oil into their heads, a luxury I personally find I could do without, but I will stick with the metaphor. Love should say no when, like King David, you decide that Bathsheba seems particularly attractive even while she's married. Love should say no when I'm flattered you want to rub my head with oil, but, you know, I'm doing just fine. Love says no when we begin to mistake our wants for our needs, our desires for our necessities. I may want to go out to hang out with my friends right now. I may want to go out on spring break in the midst of a world crisis. But love says no. I say no to me, I say no to others, because love cares about other people more than trying to meet the various wants that we have. That does not mean sacrificing all of our needs or foregoing our desires for a lifetime, but love sh should concern itself with living before living it up. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For love is about caring for the person, not fulfilling that person's three wishes. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me, me beside the still waters. For love is calming. Love is supportive. Love is still anxious, but occasionally it calms that anxiety. It calms the fears in our hearts. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For love keeps me breathing. Love holds me to the right path of loving others in return, building that love, weaving it together throughout my life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
For love does not make what we fear disappear. It's not magic. Love helps us to manage and to get beyond those fears so we can face the challenges we have, even under the very shadow of death. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. For love feeds and nurtures and embraces. Love is a blessing, and love inspires each of us to be a blessing in the world. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For love seeks out the good. Love forgives. And so in lives marked by love, loved, received, and love given, goodness and mercy will always be found. For we are offering goodness and mercy, even as we are blessed with goodness and mercy. For love is God, and God is love. If you offer love, if you receive love, if you see love, there you will find God. For it has been said that God is likely more than love, but God is never less than love. So ends the sermon. Let us end in prayer. Gracious God, we pray this day for the needs of our days. We seek our stillness and calm in a noisy world, in a fearful time. Our breath catches and needs to be eased by your loving presence. Help us to follow the path toward righteousness, the path of your name, the path of love. Even as we pass through the shadows of an uncertain time, guide us, protect us, show us the way forward. Even as our many wants may remain unmet, remind us of the simple blessings we have in abundance. Grant to us goodness and mercy so we may offer that goodness to the world and our forgiveness to one another always. And this we all ask in your holy name. Amen. Our service is now ended. May our service to one another never end. Go in peace and God bless you all.